And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always is my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. We are back with our, with the, with our newest long-form entry of Valley of the Judged. And it, and... It's been it's been a while since we tackled something SF related. We've been drowning in fantasy for the last few months. So now we're do, now we're doing something science fantasy, so we're not completely away from old habits. <laughs> fantasy is nice and all, but sometimes you want the nice hum of that reactor and maybe a little bit of magic. Um oh wait, no, I'm just I'm describing magic knights rare earth. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> As always, um, this is your call to arms. Join my uh, robot test guinea—I mean, pilot program today. Um, you will be rewarded, and citizenship is assured. I'm starting to take the Starship Troopers approach. Uh, and before you ask, no, it's not called Outer Heaven because that just sounds dumb. And it's not called Zanzibar Land either. That's even dumber. Then what did you decide to call it? Isn't it... Isn't it obvious, Monk? It's Yggdrasil. The name of my country is Yggdrasil, the world tree, where we touch all realms, and if anybody tries to storm us, we'll fucking murder you. Okay. Don't make me pull a Gungnir. I will summon rods from God, you bastards. <laughs> But reg but regardless, after after do after after spending the after spending the amount of time after spending the amount of time that we did on heavens and heresies, which was which was a good time, and as I mentioned before, it won't be the last time we tackle it. Um, I wanted to went I wanted to venture into something a little bit away from. The, from the usual D, the usual D20 and fantasy fairs largely because I didn't want that to be the sole focus of this series you know variety is the spice of life and I've made it clear I don't want to just be a one system guy when it comes to this channel not to mention uh, monk and I are big foodies both literally and figuratively mm-hmm So, Monk, I suppose that means we tell them what we're actually reviewing today. Yeah. So, this is Veil of the Void. Um, it is going is it is going to be on the science fantasy end of things, as if the cover wasn't all that obvious. <laughs> we are we are um ta we are taking and we are taking we are going to be taking a bit of a different approach. The last time we were able to go largely chapter by chapter. This time around, we're going to be jumping around a bit, into into an order that I, f I find a bit more apropos for the for this setup. Not saying that the not saying that the creators of it should should drop everything and go with the chapter order. We will, but I didn't want to, I didn't want us to be bouncing back and forth between things. So this is the order that I ended up sticking to. Indeed. Now, we. Now, for this particular episode, we are going to focus on two things: the general introduction and the core rules. Further chapters will be more specific, since I actually have I actually have a set of graphics I can use to separate each episode, as opposed to what I've had to do in the past. So, and as an, as a, as a note as a note of of full disclosure. I did back Veil of the Void Reforged originally the originally in PDF version. Um, then Trevor gave sent me a physical copy, a bit late because we had because there were shipping issues, i.e. wrong address. Um, Not and Trevor's I, and fault. I've, in, and I've interviewed Trevor on the on the in the past here on the channel. 
so all things to keep in mind for this. So we start off with the general introduction, where, Ve where Veil of, it, of the Void called itself a beginner-friendly role-playing game focused on story, flavor, and most importantly, fun. If you're a pro at role-playing games, you'll find the rules and versatility to build anything you can imagine. And if you've never played a role-playing game before, don't worry, we'll explain these t all these terms. A lot of this I'm, go I'm going to be... I'm going to be skipping because, well, you don't need you don't need me to tell you what a role playing game is for the umpteenth time. I don't know. There might be some people watching who might, but you know, they also think that their favorite flavor of crayon is purple. Oh, so they're Russell Westbrook fans, or Jarheads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love you guys out there, but you know, internecine rivalry will never. Uh will never be trumped within the armed services of the U.S. That that and I think everybody's got one story of the, of um of, spe of special forces doing something stupid with TikTok now more than ever. <laughs> um, I think one of the more mundane ones is you is using a is using a cannon to wake somebody up who fell asleep. Yeah, that 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 tends to get you, you know, kitchen duty, potato duty, or whatever else for weeks on end. Oh, this was this was this was way this was way out there. So I think it's a case mm -hmm. of when you're out in the when you're out in the middle of nowhere with nothing to do, people get creative, <laughs> and not always in the best ways. Oh, there was that whole there was that whole time when Z when Zack ended up punching a hole in the in a, in a vehicle ceiling by accident because he ex because he made because he made a miniature cannon out of boredom. Yeah. But that be that being said, skipping skipping a couple of paragraphs, it does go, then goes. Veil of the Void has its universe, classes, and species. But you can use the rules in any setting or genre. I don't know about that. Whenever I, whenever I hear that, whenever I hear that, and no offense, Trevor, but house ruling, uh, i.e. the i.e. the home brewing thing that they br that they bring up, um, that's going to be a case of the ju of well, be the, of the jet of that's jury's out on that because. How many times have we seen it where somebody says that, and yet, that, and yet their system is clearly meant for specific playstyles? I mean, what about the thing that we harp on all the time that says that? Hi, D and D. Mm -hmm. And before, um, let me <laughs> let me take this time to remind to remind everybody that we are not just that we are not just another bunch of five E haters. No, we've been we've had our we've had our critiques for long before that. Mm, critiquing A D and D two. Mm, I still hate Thacko. I don't have as uh, hatred for Thacko as you do, but I'm not but I'm not going to defend it. Yeah. Oh. Now I I would like to say that he he acknowledges it has a set universe. Mm -hmm. He says that. Uh, but that you can use the rules in any setting or genre. I think he means literally just the gameplay rules. In that case, we're, in that case, we're good. Yeah, I uh, I don't know that he meant you could use the classes and species because he he talks about the rules as if it's separate from what he just said before. Um, if. If Trevor decides to pull a tanner and, and watch these episodes, maybe he could provide us some clarification. Mm -hmm. But I don't expect everybody to be like Tanner. <laughs> well, I I will give him credit for having a bit more creative name for GM. Um, in this case, it's Galaxy Master. That is just <sighs> no offense. But that just smacks of someone who's played a little too much paranoia and likes to try and inspire a little bit 
of conflict between players and GMs. I don't know. Are you cleared for that, citizen? Yes. I programmed Alpha Complex. <laughs> So moving moving past moving past that, we're using six sided dice, which is another reason I picked this because we'll because we won't be dealing with D twenties. Um. So do I have to go? Do I have to go grab my one hundred and eight D six again? No. Oh. So now, fortunately, that's just the that the introduction is just one page long, which is. A step up, but then, but next we're going to shift a little bit into chapter two rules, and can I just say that I am super happy this PDF actually has a table of contents. Yep. And just to, just so I can make, just so, just to make sure I get the graphic um, properly taken care of, let me switch to that one right now. Probably should have put them side by side, but oh well. So, I don't know who he got to do this art. I, I assume the graphic you're using is the actual graphic for chapter two. Mm -hmm. Whoever, whoever Trevor got to do this art, that's some fucking cool art. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna lie. That's, that's a perk. Yeah. Now this focuses on the general rules. Any section with it, a um. Any section with a is I'm trying to I know the symbol I just can't remember what I just can't remember the proper carrot name. yeah carrot C A R E T a, yeah with a with next to the name our core rules and are important to remember all other rules are secondary and only matter when they appear it's a good thing that's a good thing to put in then we have I, uh... the break the breakdown and the pa and the page complete with hyperlinks while the while the bookmarks on this PDF. Um, are a little are a little lacking. I do appreciate the hyperlinks. Oh, well, I uh, the book. I, I guess the 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 bookmarks are to the like the most important places, and then you use the hyperlinks from there. It's a great way of not making a table of contents uh, with bookmarks that's too cluttered. But considering how small this book is to begin with, he may have considered doing a full table of contents in the in the sidebar. Mm -hmm. Um. I also got to say, I'm glad that in this breakdown, there aren't, like, not everything is hit with carrots. Mm -hmm. um, what the? Okay, so Monk has seen this system before. I have not, as is usual for Valley of the Judged. I'm the fresh eyes, usually. Um, color coding? Yep. Quick key guide? <laughs> okay this is quite thorough in just this breakdown page mm -hmm. um and i'm guessing that color coding is the uh actual borders around each page or borders around each section yeah that's that's fucking cool mm -hmm. i do i do do I do like this because obviously you can't make something idiot proof, but you can get you can get close. You can get damn close, and he's clearly tried to get damn close. Mm -hmm. Now, first off, we start with dice rules. Anytime you perform a skill check or attempt an attack, dice determine the outcome. Every check. Page 14. Uses the standard six-sided die. Five and sixes are hits. Ones and twos are misses. Threes and fours are neutral. A natural a natural six cannot be affected by any negative effects, and a natural one cannot be affected by any positive effects. Okay. Which is... I'm just, guessing this... Go ahead. I'm, I'm guessing that um, already that that this is going to have some fairly large dice pools. We'll see. We'll we'll come back to that later. Okay. Now that your dice pool is determined by virtues and skills. Virtues are basically the six core abilities. 
power, finesse, vitality, mentality, judgment, and charm, will be getting the character creation proper next week. Mm. Um, the number of points you have of virtue is the base number of dice you roll. You roll for a skill associated with that virtue. Which... Oh. And you get and skill bonuses also affect your total die pools for ch for checks. All skills have a vir have a virtue listed next to them. This tells you which virtue the skill uses, and therefore how many base dice you roll for the check. You may roll addition. You may gain additional dice. For example, if you have two points invested. So it this is not the typical attribute plus skill system. I like it. It's interesting. Um. You, you get your attribute, mm -hmm. which gives you your base dice, and then depending on how high your skill is, you may get bonus dice. Yeah. Skills cap at seven, each point conferring a bonus effect. So at one, at, at one you add plus one pip. At two, you get an additional die. At three, you get to reroll one failed check. You get an additional pip at four. An additional die at five. You can reduce difficulties by one level, excluding attacks at six. And at seven, you gain a unique skill effect. Now, I'm guessing that when it, sa when it says you get plus one pip and all of those, these are some of those positive effects that would not affect a natural one. Yes. Okay. Uh, then we get into what a pip is. Basically, the dots on a common di on a common die face. When a skill or bonus says add pips to a die, it means that you may increase a die result by the number of pips. So you may add pips to two dice if you roll with tw with twelve or less dice, or with three dice if you roll with thirteen or more. So it's it's basically a way to turn your near misses into hits. Yeah. I mean, th there's even an example in the box. And again, uh, the color coding for these boxes are uh, very nice. Mm. Uh, the example reads, you rolled two fours during a skill check and may add two pips. Adding one pip to each of the four results bring it to two five results. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting skill bonus system. I like it. It also is a way to turn, the to turn those near botches into just neutrals. Yeah. Oh. Then we have auto hit and auto miss dice. When a skill, class ability, or GM get gives you an auto hit slash miss die on your roll, you add one additional die to your pool. Instead of rolling this die, place it in, onto the six side if auto hit, or one side if auto miss. Why am I being reminded of the hard dice from the one roll engine? Um, because it is. And we also have a thing of auto hit slash misses count towards a critical hit slash miss. You must roll at least one natural hit to succeed a check. So it does it. So so auto sixes don't guarantee a crit, but they but they probably make a crit better or worse. Oh. And even if you do have one auto hit die, you still have to roll one natural hit. So you have to roll a five or six on the die or, the dice you're actually rolling. Yeah. The positive dice pool total can never exceed 16 dice, divided in 10 base virtue dice, 4 bonus dice, and 2 auto hit. You cannot exceed 4 bonus dice or 2 auto hit dice at any time. Your negatives can never go above 5 auto miss. So, unlike so and given that, unlike some instances where... Like with, like what we said what we said with tide tidebreaker where they claim you need 10 d6 um, I think most players would just be able to get would be able to get by with just 16 yeah um, well that's because this uh, this literally says you know your positive dice pool never exceeds 16 and your negative never exceeds five um, in so the same, in the same way like l5r has the rule of 10 no matter mm -hmm. what you can't roll more than 10 die yeah. If this also... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, this uh, This also... The reason 16 would be just the absolute limit of, of D6s you would need is uh, I imagine that the negative auto-miss dice and the positive auto-hit dice cancel each other out. 
So maybe at most you might need 17 because you might have two auto hit dice and five auto miss dice. So in all, you'd get three auto miss dice that you'd actually have to track. And sometimes you, you may not even need to like place those actual dice. You might do it anyway, just for uh, ease of tracking. Oh yeah. So then we get to rounding, always round up. Uh, then when it comes to re-rolling, you re-roll the dice used during the check, excluding auto hit slash auto miss dice. You cannot re-roll a single check more than once. If a reroll check had a six result, you may keep one six. If it has any one result dice, you must keep one of them. If you reroll a critical miss, five or more one and two results, you must keep two one results. If you reroll a critical hit, five or more five and six results, you may keep two sixes. When keeping dice during a reroll, you subtract those dice from the from the rerolled dice pool. Then we have an example here. You perform a crafting check with a dice pool of seven dice and get the following results. One, two, one, four, five, one, one. This is a critical miss. If you re-roll it, you must keep two of the one results. You would never set these two one results aside and re-roll your new total dice pool of five dice. Given that given that, I think it's I think it's a way to say that re-rolling is not a case of a reverse card. Nope, just an attempt to make sure that the check at least goes somewhat mm -hmm. your way. Yeah. Speaking of that, then we get two checks. There are three types, difficulty, contested, and group. Um, difficulty is your standard fare and is, and is a static difficulty modifier that you have to roll a number of hits. I like that instead of calling it successes, it's called hits in this one because that's what I've called it anyways for years, no matter what game I'm running. Mm -hmm. If I'm running Exalted or if I'm running Shadowrun, I know it's supposed to be called successes, but it's hits. <laughs> Everybody at the table called them hits, and I don't see a reason to not call a spade a spade. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and let's see, easy, two hits, and then it goes it goes up by one, by one for al for almost each difficulty level after that, except for impossible where you've got to get twelve, and um, better pray to R and Jesus if you're trying to get twelve hits. Unless you have you know the maximum amount of dice in your pool, which includes two auto hit dice. Mm -hmm. In which case, it's only ten hits you're rolling with yeah. fourteen dice. And, of course, if you don't have the required amount of dice, you can't succeed. I'm glad that that says that. I mean, you think it would be obvious, but I'm glad that that says that. Well, I'm glad that it says it because you've probably, had to deal, you, much like myself, have had to deal with that person who goes, I have a 5% chance to succeed. No, you don't. You have a 0% chance to succeed. Because I said so. Or, in some cases, the dice gods decide to be cruel and you roll a natural one. <laughs> Go watch Darkness Rising, people. Oh. And if... It goes on to say, if you cannot succeed at a non-attack a non, a non -attack skill check and you have zero to two skill points invested in the skill, you may perform a advantageous failure action. This allows you to take an advantageous failure to cause a smaller effect and gain a successful roll on the check. Example, and we'll go into that later. Example, you are not trained in programming and roll with four dice, but are attempting to shut down an auto-defense turret with a tough five check. You cannot succeed this check, but take an advantageous failure. This grants one successful roll in programming. Taking this will not shut off the turrets, but you manage to turn off the friend info tracking system. It's a nice way to do fail forward. Fail forward. I like the fact that it says, well, you won't shut them down, but you might turn off IFF. That actually might be better in some situations. Mm -hmm. oh. Let's see, then we have con then we have contested check, which works about the way you'd expect. Both sides, both parties roll. Whoever gets more hits is the winner. 
Mm-hmm. Oh. And ties are re-rolled until one side is victorious. Mm -hmm. Then we have group ch we have group checks and assisting, which occurs when two or more characters work to work together. You subtract the total number of misses from the total number of it of hits. The remaining hits are compared against the difficulty check. If the required amount is met, then the check succeeds. Instead of rolling a, a group skill check, you may assist, adding an auto-hit die to the final pool. If assisting and the check succeeds, you gain a successful roll in the used skill. Up to two people may assist. Nice. Mm -hmm. Again, stand, pretty standard fare. Then we get to determination. For every two points invested into judgment, you gain plus one bonus max determination point. Your, deter your max determination is equal to your level plus bonus max determination. Example, at level 7 with 4 judgment, you would have 9 max determination. The GM decides when these reset. With determination, you can spend 1 point to add 1 pip to any die, including damage. 2 points to reroll your check. May reroll a previously rerolled check once per round. Or 5 points... Force an adversary to re-roll a check. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Kind of feels like um, the momentum uh, that we saw over in the Tidebreaker quick play. Yeah, I could, I could certainly see that. Um, then we have critical hit and miss. If you roll five or more natural hits, you roll a critical. And if you roll five or more natural misses, it's a critical miss. These do not mean you automatically fail or succeed a check, but they can help or hinder you dramatically. If you roll a critical but fail the check, that's an advantageous failure. So and probably if, just like the previous advantageous failure rule. Yep. If you roll a critical yeah. miss and succeed the check, it's a unfortunate success. So a you succeed, but... <laughs> it's the computer die all over again yep. if you roll a critical miss and you fail the check it's a critical fail so you failed and yep. and a critical success is when you roll a critical hit exceed the number of exceed the difficulty and succeed the check so you succeed and mm -hmm. And there are examples for each of these. Um, again, the critical critical hit but fail with the advantageous failure. Uh, you are performing a check to hack into an AI and roll a critical hit but fail the check. While you fail at hacking into the AI, you do open a backdoor access port that might allow you to try again next time with another hit die. Uh, with the unfortunate success, while performing the hack against the AI, you succeed at hacking the unit. However, the auto defense system activates. The AI goes haywire and attacks everything around it. Uh, the critical fail, while attempting to hack the AI, you trigger its defense system. This locks you out of attempting another check and sends you out uh, and sends out an electrical spark that inflicts 10 damage to you and all nearby allies. And then with critical success, you attempt to hack the AI and must perform a problematic seven hits programming check to do so. On your check, you roll eight hits. This would cause a critical critical success. Not only do you hack the AI as you intended, you also gain full control of it for an hour. Wait, what? What's that last one? Finally, you might roll a critical hit and a critical miss in the same roll. What? There's a bit of crazy. Why do I hear Malkavians? <laughs> Why indeed? So then we have the critical table. Whenever a critical success attack is rolled, add 1d6 to the final damage. Additionally, twice per round after a critical success attack, roll 1d6 and consult the critical table. As a note, a PC or adversary can critically succeed as many attacks in combat as they have attack options, but can only roll on the critical table twice per round. So... The critical table's effects are minor injury, roll 1d3. If it's a 1, they have half movement. 2, they lose a reaction. 
three target inflicts half half damage each procs once per target two deal plus five bonus damage three uh major in major injury roll one d3 so it, either it's a twisted ankle a dislocated shoulder or a sprained wrist each procs once per target on a four target has two auto missed dice on their next check on a five Roll with plus one auto hit die on your next check against the hit target and inflict the stun condition. And on a six, weak spot. You found the weak point in an adversary or landed a headshot and instantly kill average adversaries. On PCs and strong and greater adversaries, inflict double damage. And this is rolled twice per round after you succeed at a critical success attack. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it says critical critically succeeding a medicament check during a short rest heals major heals major injuries minor injuries heal after combat ends. If target is inflicted with all three major minor and major injuries, add plus one to all rolls on the critical table. <laughs> and then we have multiple criticals hits. Ten natural hits or misses on a check is a multi-crit. When multi-critting on a single attack, roll twice on the critical table, but only add the additional damage the first time. Nice. Let's see, then we have HP and energy shields. All classes start out with 12 plus vitality and max HP. And raise their max HP based on the leveling HP of their base class. Which, the example that they give is the Architect, which raises it by 1d6 or 3, plus Vitality. Oh, then we have Energy Shields, which are, which are going to reduce, en uh, reduce range damage by a set amount once per round. They cannot be turned off to selectively block attacks. PCs can have a max of 15 Energy Shield points at one time. Non-plasma melee weapons, caliber ranged weapons, and spells all pierce shields. Because they're physical. Mm -hmm. And spells are magical. Yep. Let's see, then we have conditions. So let's see, we have armor break. All, atta all attacks roll with a plus one auto hit die for two rounds. Bleeding inflicts that amount of damage every round for the number of rounds. Bleeding snacks and can be stopped by using a synthetic skin item. Blind, all sight-based skill checks, roll with four auto-miss dice and minus four bonus dice. So you don't get any bonus dice. Mm -hmm. Burning I'm, I'm and four. slash catch fire. Um, plus four to PL for a total for a total of fifteen in fi in fire damage every round for three rounds can be extinguished using a channel action if a target is burning and hit by burning again instead of adding to to the round duration it immediately takes half the burning damage so you can't be set on fire while you're set on fire so people can roast marshmallows while they roast marshmallows just remember give a man a fire and he'll be warm for a day set a man on fire and he'll be warm for the rest of his life the truth. Uh, then we have Confusion. They'll attack the nearest creature, whether friend or foe. Last three rounds. If there are multiple nearby units, roll to determine which will be the target. Then we have Darkness slash Dark. See the blind condition. We have Dim Light. Roll with two auto miss chant dices. And minus two die on all sight checks. We have Drained. All on... Outgoing healing is halved for two rounds. Um, fear, a contested mentality power check, and on a failure, run base movement away from the square or being that caused the fear. Activates reactionary strikes, which we'll get which we'll get into later. Grasp, at the start of each turn, perform a contested muscle slash power check. If they lose, they cannot perform actions or reactions. 
it's nice. It's always nice to have simple grappling rules instead of the column of text we had to deal with 20 years ago. You mean the column of text that any good GM ignores and just says, fuck grappling? Yeah. Madness, roll 1d6 and consult the f and consult a chart. On a 1, you're knocked prone and screaming in laughter for two rounds. If hit, you can perform a mentality check to wake from the nightmare. On 2, you attack the closest unit with an auto-hit die, inflicting an additional 1d6 damage. On 3, you take an immediate 10% max HP and chaotic damage and have paranoia for two rounds gaining an auto-miss die on checks while within eight squares of another ally. <laughs> uh, on four, a maddening sickness affects the unit for the next three rounds. All incoming healing is negated. On five, you're blind for two rounds, and on six, you're afflicted with void sickness, which we will not be getting to tonight. Not until much, much later. Mm -hmm. Uh then we have Poison. Um, take PL in physical damage instantly, then roll 1d2. On a 1, you're inflicted with Sickly. On a 2, you're inflicted with Drain. Um, with pr then is Prone. You're knocked onto your back or front, and half movement is required to get back up. You lose reactions while prone, and melee attacks against you have one auto hit. On Sickly, all incoming healing is halved for two rounds. On Stun, you lose an action, reaction, and half movement on your turn. Cannot be stunned for another three rounds. It's a good way to avoid stun locking. Yeah. Oh. Then we have Suffocating. You suffer 20% of your max HP and damage every round. Five rounds and you die. Better not telefrag yourself. And Taunted, you must attack the Taunting Unit. If you attempt to attack anything other than the Taunting Unit, you'll have to perform a Hard 4 Mentality Check. If you fail, you must attack the Taunting Target. Last two rounds. See, and then we have Death and Resurrection. And when you go, when you go to 0 HP, you go into a down state and start counting negative HP. You have a total of 8 negative HP. When you go into the down state, you start at 0. During a down state, you have one action you can take per turn. Sustain. When performing this action, roll a d6. If you roll a 5 or a 6, you gain one death hit and do not add to your negative HP. Negative HP. A 1 result makes you lose 2 HP instead of 1. 4 death hits stabilize your character to 1 HP. I certainly like that over the three strike death save thing I've seen in certain games. Oh, if you do not or cannot roll a death hit, you lose one HP. When you reach a negative HP of five plus, you are knocked unconscious, preventing you from performing any actions, and will lose one HP around until the until you reach negative eight. At negative eight, you die when the round ends. Someone can perform a difficulty 4 medicament check to stabilize you, bringing you back to 1 HP. If you're knocked down to 0 HP again, the cycle repeats. Oh, and here's an interesting thing. Healing items, abilities, and spells used on a target with negative HP does not heal them. It just grants them two death hits. And can only affect the same target once per round. So, no Phoenix Downing your way out of out of boss fights. In two rounds, you could do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that whole thing of quickly getting back in the fight, not happening here. Yeah. Let's see. If your character dies, there's a chance for resurrection through spells and items that beseech Eloa. We'll get to that later. Resurrection is not easy on a mortal soul. However, when a character is resurrect resurrected, they gain the expertise resurrected. Oh. Let's see, then we go into healing and rests. 
Um, so a a rest is basically downtime. Um, it can, he which is going to heal HP, some abilities, and the charge state, which is, as I recall, basically cooldown for certain abilities. A short rest is one to five hours long. Um, and you heal half your missing HP. Your realm charge states, we'll get to that later, reduced by four points. Some class abilities and points also recharge during a short rest. A long rest is six to nine hours. During a long rest, all actively resting party members heal up to full. The energizing state resets to zero. Most class abilities slash points that require a rest reset during this time. And during combat, cancels a rest. Yeah, I, th I think you need to be Drunken Master in order to be able to enter combat while sleeping. Heh. <laughs> oh. Let's see, then we have movement and flight. Mo base movement speed is represented in squares. I can hear I can hear I can hear the grog screaming. A square is five feet. Oh. Then we have flight, which I'd say works I'd say works about the way about the way that you would expect, although flight adds to your normal to your max movement speed when you're in midair. Which me which I mean, which means that it's not a case of sep of separate movement rates as it is in a lot of other cases. So if you've got a lot yeah. of movement as it is, and then you get flight, you get more. Well, and you get that no matter w uh, what phase of flight you're in. Mm -hmm. um, it says if you're on the ground, you may perform your base movement and then lift off, adding the additional flight movement. Mm -hmm. If you're landing, you may move your flight movement and then move up to your base movement speed. And of course, if you remain in midair, you get both combined. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you take this damage. also, oh, good. Oh, I was gonna say this. This also, um, this also basically for all of those who remember those dumbass rules. Uh, if you are still in, if you are still unsupported at the end of the uh, at the end of your turn while flying, you fall to the ground. Bullshit things because something that can fly with a spell or can fly with natural uh, natural flight mechanics, whether that be air jets or wings or whatever, mm -hmm. is going to stay airborne for more than 10 seconds. <laughs> oh, yeah. And if you take damage while flying, perform a difficulty 3 flight check. GM adjusting difficulty as necessary. If you fail, movement is halved. Flight is extra movement. That could be that could be a lot worse. Some GMs would have it that if you fail the roll, you fall. And then take subsequent fall damage because GMs are assholes. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we go into start of co start of combat. Before everybody rolls initiative, which is a d6 plus your finesse, highest goes first. You you know that you know the deal. Um, ties can be dis um you can have the participants decide who goes first or whoever has the highest finesse. If those are tied, whoever has the awareness expertise wins. If they're still tied, both of them roll one d6 until one player beats the other. They also say here that players. If players tie with adversaries, um, players perform their actions first. Mm -hmm. So again, cases of put in in case of tie, uh, err on side of players. Very nice. Let's see, we also have surprised and ambushed. Um, a surprised round it is what you is what you might expect. You're not you're not able to do to do anything for a round while you get while you get a few while you get your face kicked in a few times. Um, only players who have successfully performed covert skill checks against the adversaries participate in a surprise round. Uh, all players that were aware of the sneak attack get a, fr get a free round. And ambush is a surprise round with the roles reversed. All players, all players caught off guard do not get a round or reaction, and all adversaries aware of the ambush participate in a free round. So surprises are player-initiated ambushes, and ambushes are adversary-initiated ambushes. 
Interesting. So, then we have the whole thing with round and turn, which is pretty standard fare. Um, and we have movement, and I do, and we've got, we have a total of seven different actions that utilize the movement phase. Oh, nice. Um, sprinting, aiming, disenga disengage, channeling, maintain channeling, rearm slash reload, and unjamming. I like uh, aim, sacrifice your movement, to and an extra action to gain plus one auto-hit die on attacks with the weapon. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> channeling. Um, almost everything uses half max movement at some point. And in channel maintain, channel rearm, and unjam. But channel also costs an action. Which, given that that's going to be what you're going to be using for magic, it, um, it's basically a case of you have phenomenal cosmic power, but when you're using it, you're a sitting duck. So don't Semi phenomenal, nearly cosmic power. Yee! space. see then it goes into into a bit more detail then we go into the action and extra action phase all pcs have both at most you can have two extra actions in one turn after your action and and, and extra actions have been performed you may use any remaining movement after all of this your turn ends then the next one goes and the yep. cosmic ballet goes on <laughs> I understood that reference. See, then we have cooldown slash duration, which which is another thing they'll probably get the grogs mad because you know we're not we're not allowed to, because anything that says cooldown makes them makes them scream, turning tabletop into an MMO. Anything that says cooldown ironically makes them heat up. Yes. I can feel it, Monk. Mm -hmm. Let it flow! <laughs> yeah. Now, it used the spell Channeled Inferno as an example for cooldown, and I will note some, something I do, f I do find interesting. I ended up buying the spell cards at mm -hmm. Adam. I've got, it right, I've got it right on my desk. And on the example spell cards is <laughs> what looks like a, a set of die pips, and that's basically there to be a Stand in so you so you can look at it and see what your spell's cooldown is, and nice. that applies. That obviously applies to things other than spells. That's just since they want to use that example, I figured I'd follow suit. Oh, uh, and of course, of course, before the action phase begins, each one ticks down by one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, then we have uh, then we have attacking, which is a skill difficulty based on the opponent's armor level. At the lightest, two hits. At the highest, reinforced armor. You need five hits. Most physical attacks use either power or finesse. Spell attacks use arcanting virtues, so mentality, judgment, and on occasion, power. Whenever you perform an at an attack, add two bonus dice to your pool to your pool. Roll that. You think? Go ahead. You think when he said "and on occasion power," he was t thinking about a, a about the wizard that casts fist? <laughs> I'll have to ask him. Um, then you roll you roll your dice against the defender's armor if you meet or beat it. You succeed the attack. I always, I always like the age-old rule of ties go to the attacker. Mm -hmm. um, if you have points invested in attack skills, you gain their special effects. When you use an attack <coughs> skill, you'll use either weapons master or dual wielding, depending on the number of wep on the number of weapons. If you're attacking with two or more weapons, you will use dual wielding. If you're using a single-handed or two-handed, you'll use weapon master. If you are performing an arcane spell attack, you'll use arcanting. Then so my my qu my question is, why is it called dual wielding when it when it says that you can attack with two or more weapons? Shouldn't it be multi wielding? I think I think it's habit. Probably. 
Oh. Especially since I'm pretty sure a good chunk of the species aren't gonna aren't going to be multi armed in that regard. Yeah, but what if one of them is General Grievous? Well hello there. Ah, General Kenobi. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, do um <laughs> This is interesting to me because We've seen plenty of times that dual wielding is a fantasy everybody wants to do, and a whole lot of RPGs don't know how to do it. Or, or in some cases, punish you for doing it. Hi, 3rd edition. Mm, yes. Dual wielding. Pay to suck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be less effective here? Dual wielding in 3E. In this case, you use one attack action to attack with both weapons, rolling twice to determine whether each weapon hits. You are not required to have a point invested into dual wielding to use dual weapons. If you do not have two points invested in the skill, you suffer a few penalties. Your offhand attack rolls with minus two bonus dice, or you cannot, def or you cannot deflect. I think it's and you cannot, and you, and you cannot deflect. deflect. I think um, I think those are both what you get if you don't have yep. two points in dual wielding, which technically is pay to not suck, but I'd say it's not as egregious. Well, and you don't have to do you don't have to attack with both weapons. You can attack with just one. Mm -hmm. Um, what you're basically what you're paying to do here, um is it's not that you're paying not to suck you're paying to get extra damage mm -hmm. and so that payment pays forward also let me correct myself the offhand attack is penalized yes your normal hand your normal hand will be just fine mm -hmm. um i think the the more important thing there is that you can't deflect which we'll be going into shortly yep <laughs> and if you're attacking with only one weapon you use weapons master like, like I said, if we're if using two, use dual wielding. Using multiple attack act actions with the same weapon uses weapons master. And if if granted, it, if with dual wielding, if you're granted an extra attack by a skill or ability, you may attack with both weapons again. Yeah, and, and so that's why I'm saying it's not pay not to suck. It's pay to do better by by paying for dual wielding. You're paying to use one attack action to attack multiple times. Or at least with multiple weapons. Mm -hmm. If you have an extra attack action, you may perform dual wielding attacks at most twice per round, meaning four attacks max, two by each weapon. You may attack with the same weapon using Weapons Master up to five times. I think that's a good trade I think that's a good trade off because whenever it comes to dual wielding, there's the question of how do you make it so that it's useful, but it doesn't outstrip those who don't want to use it? I imagine dual wielding is something that you would you might choose to use on a class that doesn't have as many extra attack options. So, to fill in a gap that you might have. Mm -hmm. Classes are specialized. That's, not, that's always a thing. Each class is supposed to ex excel at something so that it's unique. But not also, but also not outstrip everything else to make itself its only choice. Yeah. Um. And so, if you have a, an attack that's slightly, or you have a, a class that's like maybe really good at support, but they they just don't have damage output, mm -hmm. you might choose to go dual wielding uh, because you don't have a lot of extra attack options, but you can make up for that. Yep. So this is not only not pay not to suck. This is pay to fill in weaknesses. Mm -hmm. I like it. So then, when adding pips, you can add pips to at most two attacks, or three when using single. Which I'm perfectly fine with. It means you it means you gotta you've gotta determine what what um attacks you're actually gonna use that kind of thing for. Yep. I really like the trade off, and I really like how it gives you flexibility. So then we get to ranged attacks, which have a range next to their damage in the equipment section. For example, a short bow has 14 to 20, 14, 28 squares. 
The 14 represents the extent of the weapon's short range, 28 their long range. You may fire beyond your long range, though each increment um, exceeding the long range subtracts one bonus die from your dice pool. You roll ranged attacks against the target armor as you would a melee attack. Let's see, and when locked in melee combat, you cannot perform a ranged attack against a non-adjacent adversary. If the locked adversary goes before you in the round, you roll with minus one bonus die on your attacks that round. So no firing in melee. Well, I think it's saying that you can't perform a ranged attack against an adversary that's further than who you're locked in melee combat with. Mm -hmm. But you might be able to point blank shoot them, so you could still Han Solo. Yeah. Um, Just remember, folks, Han shot first. Always. And anyone who claims otherwise is a dirty liar. Or is getting but, uh, by Kathleen Kennedy. So a dirty liar. It's a tautology there, Monk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'd also I'd also like to make a quick note here. An increment, when it was talking about range increments, is the the distance between your short range and your long range. Mm -hmm. So for the short bow, you know, your short range is fourteen, your long range is twenty eight. That's a difference of 14. So if you, for every 14 squares you fire past, for, or for every section of 14 squares you fire past 28 squares, you subtract a bonus die. Mm -hmm. So at, uh, at 42, at 42 squares, if you go to 43, you'd then be at minus two bonus dice. Mm -hmm. Um, it just... I, I did want to specify that because uh, in increment can mean a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Let's see. If you're attacking with a heavy ranged weapon in melee range, you do so with three auto miss. So don't try don't try and use don't try and use a rocket launcher in point blank range. But that should be an, uh, that should be a bunch of auto hits against you and everyone else. <laughs> Well, it may, it may be. We'll determine that when we get to equipment down the road. I also, uh, would I imagine when they say heavy ranged weapon within melee range is something like, um, heavies, heavy weapons guy's chain gun? Mm hmm So. Can I bash with it? Can I use it as an improvised, uh, melee weapon? I wonder. I'd probably allow it. Um. When throwing an item or weapon, you th you can throw it up to power times two in squares. So does this, given the given the rules for grasping, I do have to ask, ask the question with this: Could somebody with a sufficient amount of power engage in competitive bitch tossing? Where they hit a motherfucker with another motherfucker. <laughs> One of our favorite things to do here in the mo in the monastery. Now, with damage, after it hits, you inflict damage to their current HP. You add the attack virtue used used to the final used to the final damage. Um, example: Suppose a field knight uses a chain sword to attack. That uses power. After they perform the attack, add the power virtue to the final damage roll. Damage wow! Damage. You just add the entire virtue score. That's cool. Damage is dealt using D6s and is inflicted on the current HP pool. And they have examples of if you're t told you do D2 damage, that means a 1, 2, 3 is a 1, and a 4, 5, 6 is a 2, etc. Mm -hmm. Huh. Nice. But it's a, it, it, said it said final damage total, so that, so that virtue is a baseline for your damage. Yeah. Yeah, you, you're you're gonna add whatever virtue straight up to whatever your damage is. Mm -hmm. So long as you hit, you're doing that virtue plus one at the very least. So then we have. Then we get to damage types. Mm -hmm. Fun, fun. Let's see. So we ha we have a f so there's a few unique ones called complex types, most which include multiple base types. So we have pure, 
which cannot be re cannot be resisted or blocked by anything, including shields or abilities. Elemental, self-explanatory. Physical, also self-explanatory. Natural, mm -hmm. which includes nature and ether damage types. Yep. And shadow deals 10% additional damage to celestial creatures and 20 percent damage to all targets when cast in the dark. Shikamaru would have a heal day, field day. Mm -hmm. So, to so <laughs> Tokoyami. <laughs> Dude, have them team up. Come on. <laughs> uh, then we have resist. Then we have resistance type. Damage you take from a resistance so re resisted source is reduced by twenty percent. Protection by fifty percent. Immunity, 100%, and is rare. Resistances do not stack, and the highest resistance takes precedence. If an attack inflicts multiple damage types, you require resistance to the multiple types in order to resist the damage. So, resistant, so it's, it's resistance, protection, immunity, and if you have multiple damage types, you have to have resist, at least resistance in all of the types to resist the damage. Mm -hmm. That's... So, in, in our RPG in your face um, example from earlier, would you imagine that that's physical and elemental because of the fire? Yes. <clears throat> that's going to be fun. Mm -hmm. oh. And of course, if you have a weakness, the damage is increased by 20%. And that's it. That's I like that. You can get resistances that are higher... And your weakness is basically at twenty, um, and it. I'm I'm guessing even if it's a multi damage type weakness, it's still only twenty percent total, for whatever the damage is. Mm -hmm. That's what makes sense. Yeah. Then we have reaction. Outside of your turn, you have a reaction. One of you have the first one that they mentioned is deflect. And this is the one that we were talking about earlier that you cannot deflect if you haven't paid for dual wielding when you're wielding two weapons. Mm -hmm. To deflect, you perform a contested power, finesse, or defense check. Defense may be used only if it has at least one point against the original attack roll. If the defender wins, they take no damage. If the attacker wins, it's a success as normal. On a tie, they re-roll. Oh, Nice! An active defense. I like it, but it costs a reaction. Yep. So you get that chance to you get that chance to skip damage, but you're only getting one. Maybe two, depending on your class. Mm -hmm. Who knows? We'll we'll get there when we get there. Yeah. Then we have reactionary strike, which is look looking at this, it's an AOO. Yeah. It is basically the AOO. And that more that more or less covers the basics. This was going to be a, this was going to be a shorter episode, which I, I was I was well aware of that fact because we're covering the ba the base, the corest of the core part of the die mechanics. So first things first, I don't think the Shadowrun pounds of dice meme applies here. We very clearly have caps. Mm-hmm. Secondly, the d the way that it the way that it ends up working, um, I've always I've always enjoyed pools of d sixes because they have a they have a very fair bell curve. They have a fair bell curve, and um, from an, an outside uh, the actual curve that we're considering, they're just really nice to roll. Mm -hmm. Now. The pip thing, I haven't, I haven't seen pip use. The last game I saw have an extensive amount of pip use, is, is stuff like d6. Well, considering that this game does seem seem to have at least a little bit of inspiration from mm -hmm. games that primarily use d6s, I'm not surprised. Yeah, but in that in that case, the pip was just a stat was just a static modifier, not a umbrella. Mm-hmm. Perhaps, par perhaps parachute would be better. Yeah, a golden parachute. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I do I do <coughs> appreciate I do appreciate that even though you have shield, it's not a case of the, of that being extra HP extra HP in the same sense. There, it's it certainly is, but it's not perfect. Yeah, it only blocks uh, energy based attack types. Mm -hmm. When you use a non you know what was it a non uh, plasma based melee weapon or a caliber based ranged weapon or uh, magic. It's very specific, yeah. Non-plasma melee weapons, caliber ranged weapons, and spells. Um, so, if you're using an energy-based melee weapon, so a plasma weapon, mm -hmm. the shield is going to help block some of that damage. And if you're using energy ranged weapons, laser rifles and such, those are going to be blocked by the energy shield. This just means that Blade has an, an advantage in this universe. Yeah, it also me one particular question that I that I've seen get I've seen get brought up especially with stuff like Star Wars is why no why nobody you why nobody uses slug projectiles. Of course the of course the obvious the obvious reason is no is um <laughs> is no is nobody wanting to is the production being too cheap to afford, to have those kind of weapons and later on be Lucas being Lucas. Um, although I could easily, s but it is a, it is a question that, that I think sh that I think is answered, and I the usual answer is that is that is that energy weapons are b would be better in that situation, you know, because because not having recoil, except I I don't buy the idea that energy weapons wouldn't have recoil. Um. So most energy based, uh, if, if we look at real life lasers, they really do have a, a very small amount of backwards push. Mm -hmm. But that's true of anything that uses photons for energy. Yeah. <clears throat> Particle accelerators, which are the closest thing to plasma generation we have, besides just an actual plasma generator. It's harder to measure in because you've got magnetic forces that are forcing the particles to accelerate that are already acting. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's what's going to happen in order to make it so that not that you know everybody's just going to say fuck energy weapons, I'm going to go physical all the way because shields are bullshit. There's there's going to be something energy weapons do that gives them an edge, so that you'd actually have a tactical decision to make. Yeah. Of, do I have something that ignores shields, but maybe only does damage from one type of source? Yeah. In something like Battletech, for instance, you have the dividing line between f between physical and energy weapons. Although, t if you want to get real technical, you have the you have the dividing line between between bullets, missiles, and lasers. But uh, that's getting a bit pedantic. Energy weapons don't have to worry about ammo. What they do have to worry about is heat management. Yep. I have seen one too many people run an atlas with way too many heavy lasers and blow themselves up. Or in, or in, some, or in some cases, overheat, shut down, and get blown up because you're a sitting duck for several seconds. Several agonizing seconds. <laughs> playing some of the sometimes playing mech warrior and watching someone overheat is the greatest psychological torture you can inflict by just walking up to them like you if you have voice chat on you can hear the panic it is the best thing and then you just choose to shoot them until they're dead with probably your weakest weapon there was one there was one guy i remember who um Th who thought that who thought that he was the hot thought that he was the hottest shit because he, because he had the um he had a he decided to deck out a marauder in most in largely en in largely energy weapons. <sighs> um, he got ro I would have roasted him over it, but he but he got ro he got roasted because he, because he kept he forgot to lead his shots, ended up getting blown up and his and his team. His team lambasted him about the fact that you just wrecked a fucking marauder. 
Good fucking job breaking it. But um, yeah, if with you, with the wep listen. with the weapon. Uh, go ahead. If you listen close, you can hear the sound of ang you could hear the sound of angry bagpipes cursing his name. Ha! <laughs> ha! True. But, uh, yeah, I imagine that when we eventually get to equipment and such, we'll see the differences between the energy-based weapons and the physical weapons and see what the trade-off is. Yes. And <sighs> I'd, say an I'd say another thing that I, cer that I, certainly, li I certainly like is the, f is the fact that when it, comes to the when it comes to the degrees of success with this, there are there are there are positive and negative um states mhm mm is with with a lot of these kind, with a lot of these kind of things when you have it when you have a die pool it is very difficult to fail especially the high, especially the higher die pool you have well and especially with game, like most games i see that use large scale die pools beyond shadowrun mm -hmm. and other d6 games it's D10s. Like, outside of the D6 sphere, it's only, large die pool games tend to be D10s, from what I've seen. I'd say, I don't know if that's just confirmation bias because of playing so no, many White Wolf games. No, it, it, is, it is fairly accurate. D10s tend to get used a lot more. Um, there have been, I have seen a few that use, D, that use D12s. Encore uses D12s, and Riddle of Steel used a D12 pool. D12s don't get enough love. No, they don't. Um, the but the but as you get die dice pools with dice that have larger face counts, failure is harder than success, mm -hmm. and critical failure even harder. So still, yeah. I think a D, a D6 because of that bell curve you were mentioning earlier uh, has a nice a nice. The fates are either with or against you, uh, type thing going on. It's the it's it really does feel like chance. Mm -hmm. And I do remember somebody somebody doing a pro ah found found it. Somebody actually did a full on a full on chart regarding the number of success the pro the success probabilities with a certain amount of dice. Um, they went all the way up to fifteen. I will, I will send you the ch the um, chart and putting it, putting it in. Um, yeah, put this in Valley of the Judged for you. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Higher dice pools, everything everything curves to your probability of success and your numbers of successes. Um, like like they say there with the dice pool of fifteen dice, your uh, chance of success is n uh, of at least one success is near one hundred percent. That that's a cool. I like this curve. I like it. It's cool. Mm -hmm. I am, if nothing else, the player of games and the master of finding things. Indeed. Now, that be that being said, the I would I'm going to be very interested when we get when we get into um d into think into things like determination and how that's recovered. Obviously, I can I can infer some things just from experience. Well, and there was an example um, when it came to determination. Uh, let me get there. Uh, it says, you know, the GM decides when determination is reset. Um, example: the players killed one of the major antagonists and are about and are at a breaking point in the story, about to move on in the arc. Determination could reset here. So determination is is more about feeling than anything else. You could also say that your determination refills every session too. I imagine. Mm -hmm. I I uh, 
something I, I glossed over when we talked about uh, reactionary strike that I do feel needs to be clarified. Um, the area around w a, a, a combatant at which you can provoke those reactionary strikes is the full grid around them, including corners. So for a medium character who only takes up one square, the eight squares surrounding them are their AOO area. <clears throat> um, however, this... Oh, I, I missed that part too. Neat thing. If you move into someone's reaction area and stop immediately without moving any further, you're safe. Interesting. Oh, yeah. I know, th I know that we skimmed over a few things, and some of that is due to it being... Things that we have co that we have covered that we have covered extensively and are understandable via, via pure osmosis. Indeed. Um. Now, with that with that in mind, unlike unlike some of the previous times that we've done that we've done valley of the judge with this one it is go it is going to be a, is going to be a bit more a bit more in depth well we're you we're usually in depth but i think you know what i mean and there and there are going to be a few interesting moving parts as we go as we go through this now mm -hmm. next week next week we are going to be focusing on on character creation and i'm actually thinking of combining character creation and species because the character creation section is only about 4 pages yeah um and part of your character creation one of the important parts is going to be what species you choose to be mm -hmm. uh, so obviously class is the other half of that but classes are much like with the last few long form valleys we've done, classes are kind of the B and B. They're our bread and butter. Yeah, we're not changing the whole thing. We're not changing our habit of having each class get its own episode. That's not changing. <laughs> but with species, there there's usual there's usually not enough on the table to do, to um to de to <laughs> dedicate to dedicate a lot of time to each individual species. Yeah, I will say, Monk, that um, looking at the table of contents, each species does get a few pages. Mm -hmm. um, so combining that with, you know, the character creation section, which is itself only four pages, I think we'll have uh, one of our longer episodes. Mm -hmm. But it's still going to be good. Yeah, I, I suppose we, I suppose in that regard we'd have to make up for the for the small amount of, for the small amount of time we've spent we've spent tonight, which I knew this once again I knew this was going to be a short one. Well, short yeah. by our standards. <laughs> for those of you who uh, are just new to Valley of the Judged or the monastery in general, uh, if you look at anything having to do with Geek Watch or Valley or any of the other particular shows we do, you'll know that we're a bit long-winded. Mm -hmm. Re when you have when you have to cover things in depth, that's what you get. <laughs> also, if you want if you want to yell at us for the fact that we can't keep it brief, well, one, my my reviews are far more brief, and two, um, blame Jay, Steven, and Young. Since he's the one who basically beat who beat me to the punch with this kind of thing with his Let's Study blog series. Yep. And three, fuck you, pay me. Oh, yeah, you want me to sh make that. things? <laughs> if you weren't gonna say it, I did. Uh, the uh, you don't pay our fucking bills, and if you want us to make things shorter, well, uh, make us an offer we can't refuse. And then no, and then no show the Oscars. <laughs> but with that said, I would like to give my sincere thanks to everyone for taking the time out of their schedule to, for to come onto the show. We'll be back here next week with both character creation and a dive into the species. And there are certainly some interesting ones. And since we're not doing fantasy, no elves, though elves adjacent may happen.
Beth elves. Fucking Vulcans. <laughs> or the Eldar. Oh, fuck them too. I would I would not... say that, but they have to worry about Slanesh doing that for me. Well, that and they have to worry about their, you know, dropping birth rate. They might actually welcome something from outside the Eldar fucking them. Even Slanesh? No. Because Slanesh <laughs> makes them die. Then again, then again, then again, suicide is the better option if you end up getting captured and being brought to Kamara. Yeah. Yeah. But with that said, we will see you here next week. So until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.